Make your snack. Build a box that will light up when it's time to take your meds. A tech for good project using CircuitPython on the Raspberry Pi. It can be tough to remember to take your medications and supplements. Even with a container like this, someone might still forget and skip a dose. Now, prescription non-adherence is a major healthcare and financial issue, resulting in avoidable hospitalizations and costing thousands of lives and billions of dollars. Now, while this project isn't meant to be a real medical device in its current state, this learning exercise demonstrates how a tiny $14 computer with just a few extra parts and no soldering can be easily programmed for a potentially big impact. This step-by-step -step tutorial is beginner-friendly and can be completed even by those who are not programmers and who have never previously worked with electronics. Now, here's how the final product works. Plug it in and a light flashes showing the box is ready to start working. Opening the lid turns off the flashing light and sets the pre-programmed alerts. And when an alert time is reached, the alert light goes on, saying it's time to take your meds. Open the lid, take your meds, and the light goes off until the next alert time is reached. Now there's a parts list with links to suggested parts in the accompanying step-by-step -step guide. To build this product, you'll need a Wi-Fi capable Raspberry Pi like this low-cost Pi Zero WH. Be sure you've got a Pi with header pins. You'll need a micro SD card sized between 8 and 32 gigabytes, and if your computer doesn't have an SD card slot, and modern Mac computers don't, then you'll also need a micro SD card reader that plugs into the USB ports on your computer. Now you'll also need a power supply with a micro USB cable. They're cheap to buy, but you might already have one. I run my project off of a wall outlet and charging cable from an old pair of wireless earphones. Just remember that if you're using a Pi Zero or a Pi 3, those use a micro USB cable, which has a connector that's different from those used in any Apple products. Now you'll also need four socket on both end jumper wires. These are sometimes outdatedly referred to as female female jumper wires. You'll need an LED bulb. I used a 10 millimeter red bulb from this multi-pack. You'll also need a simple through hole resistor. 100 ohms will work fine if you use the same LED bulb that I used. You'll also need a box with a hinged lid. Any cigar style box is fine if you've got one lying around the house. I bought this clear box online for less than 10 bucks and it was perfect. And you'll need a magnetic switch which we'll use to tell if the box lid is open or closed. Now you'll also need some other tools and supplies that you may already have at home. You'll need something to cut a hole in your box. This could be a utility knife or a cordless drill. You'll need wire cutters or scissors to snip the thin legs off of the resistor and LED bulb. You'll need some electrical tape, some double-sided tape or double-sided foam to mount parts to the box, and clear packing tape is useful for taping down loose wires. Now as we start this tutorial, I'm going to assume that you've got a Raspberry Pi with a micro SD card that's configured with the Raspberry Pi OS and that's set up to work on your Wi-Fi network, and that you've got CircuitPython installed on that Pi. Now if you're an absolute beginner, you've never done this before, we've got you covered. Just follow these tutorials in this order. These are also linked in the build guide for this video, and there are videos that accompany these tutorials as well. Another bit of advice, it can take a while to prep the SD cards with all of this stuff on it, so this last tutorial here is a smart move. It'll let you copy a working SD card's image to your computer so that the next time you want to work with a Raspberry Pi project, you can just flash this image onto your backup file in about four minutes. Now let's start building this thing. Now let's work on the LED light first, and we'll take a quick look at how we're going to wire things up. By the way, even though this diagram shows the Raspberry Pi Zero W, which I'm using, the Raspberry Pi 3 models and the Raspberry Pi 4 have the same 40 pins. Now we're going to plug the socket of one of our jumper wires into GPIO pin number 24 on the Raspberry Pi board. Now the color of the wiring doesn't matter, but I'm showing this in orange because I happen to use an orange wire for this in my build. Now we'll plug the other socket of this jumper wire into a resistor, and we'll attach the other end of this resistor to one of the legs of the LED. Now that's the positive side, sometimes called the anode, and in almost all cases you'll encounter, that will be the longest LED leg. Now in this build, we're just going to wind one end of the resistor around the positive end and then we'll trim off any excess wire and we'll eventually wrap this in electrical tape. Now by winding these two pieces together, this is a no solder build, but if you have a soldering iron and you're comfortable soldering, have at it. Now the negative leg of the LED, also known as the cathode, and that's almost always the shorter leg, is going to plug into the ground jumper wire, which is going to plug into the ground pin on our Pi board. Now, if you're using the same red LED that I recommend in the parts list and a 100 ohm resistor, then you're good. But resistors come in different sizes, and if you're curious how to calculate the right resistor size, I've got a short video linked in the step-by-step -step guide that covers how to do this by checking the specs for an LED and then using an online calculator for Ohm's Law. Feel free to check it out if you're interested. Now, as mentioned, we're going to take one end of the resistor and we're going to wrap that around the positive leg or anode, which should be the longest leg in our LED. Now, this isn't pretty. I'm not especially dexterous, but it'll work. And by the way, it's okay to gently bend the negative wire out at a 90 degree angle to make winding the resistor in the positive leg a bit easier. Then you can trim any excess off of the positive end and resistor. Just don't accidentally cut the negative or cathode leg. Now, the positive and negative legs should never touch each other, so I'm going to wrap the positive leg and the resistor in some electrical tape, and then you can bend back the negative LED leg, and the legs don't need to be this long, so you can trim those down as well. 
Now here's a look at what the box build will look like. I'm going to drill a hole in the lower right hand corner of the back of the box and I'm going to run two wires from my magnetic switch out this hole and the rest of the wiring, the LED, the jumper wires and the Pi will be out the back and the side of the box. So depending on the box that you're using, you might be able to cut a small hole using just a hobby knife, but I've got a cordless drill, so I'm going to drill this hole, try to choose a bit that comes to a nice point. A quarter inch should be plenty big to pass the two wires through. Now if you're using an acrylic box, don't push too hard or go too fast. You don't want to crack it or melt the plastic. And then when the hole pokes through, just reverse the drill to pull the drill back out. Now there might be some plastic edging around the hole, but you can cut that out with a utility knife or just spin a scissors blade inside the hole to clear this away. Now the magnetic switch I'm using comes in two parts. One is wired and one isn't. Now the switch itself is in this wired part, and by default the switch inside this piece doesn't connect its two wires. Now the second half has a magnet in it, that's all. And when you bring the magnet within about a half inch of the wired part, a circuit is formed inside of this wired part, and electricity flows from one wire to the other. Now when you pull the magnet away, the circuit is broken and no electricity flows. Now the magnet isn't very strong, in fact if you bring these pieces together you probably won't even feel it. And switches like these are sometimes called reed switches. Now these switches are super inexpensive, I bought this single switch from Adafruit, but since I work with students on projects, I also got this multi-pack from Amazon, and these Amazon ones have sticky tape on the back so that you don't have to screw them in, but if you bought the Adafruit switch, you can just use double-sided foam tape to mount it. So with the hole in the back of the box, you can thread the wires from the magnetic switch through this hole, and then before attaching the switch pieces to the box, make sure that they line up properly. So the wired switch is going to be on the side of the box, but you want to leave enough room so that the magnet half that you're going to attach to the lid will be lined up right on top of this switch, but the lid will still close. Then just attach the switch parts with sticky tape. Now here's a quick look at how we're going to wire things up and what they should look like. So we're going to attach four jumper wires to the header pins on our Raspberry Pi. Now one will go into GPIO pin 23. That's the eighth pin down from the top on the Raspberry Pi Zero. We'll say the top is the end of the Pi with the SD card slot. And we'll also put a jumper wire into the pin just above this. That'll be the seventh pin, and that's a ground pin. Now we'll use these two pins for the switch, and it doesn't matter which of the switch wires goes into which of the other ends of these two jumpers. We say that the switch has no polarity, either wire can go into either jumper. Now below these two pins, you also want to attach two more jumper wires to the ninth and 10th pins. That'll be the GPIO pin 24 and another ground pin just below it. Now for LEDs, polarity is important. You want to make sure that you plug the leg with a resistor that's attached to the positive leg into the jumper wire that's attached to GPIO pin 24. And the negative leg, the one without the resistor, has to be attached to the wire that goes into the ground pin. Now we could use other pin numbers in here too, but we'll stick with these pins because the code that I've written refers to these specific pin numbers. So our Python program will send a signal to pin 24 to turn the LED on or off, and we'll also check pin 23 to see if the magnetic switch is open or closed. So I'm going to count down from the top, and I'm going to connect my first two jumper wires to the 7th and 8th pins. Now that's going to be to a ground and GPIO pin 23. And in fact, while I'm here, I'll also connect jumper wires to the pins just below this, the 9th and 10th pins counting from the top, and those will be GPIO pin 24, and the one below that is also a ground. Now you should be able to poke the ends of the magnetic switch wires into the other ends of the jumpers attached to 23 and ground. Again, no polarity here, so either jumper will do. And then you can wrap the connections in electrical tape to make sure that the wires don't fall out. Next, plug the resistor that's attached to the positive leg of the LED into the other end of the jumper wire that's attached to pin 24. And then attach the other leg, that's the negative leg, to the last ground jumper. Then you can use more double-sided foam tape to attach the LED to the back of your box. And now we're ready to work with the Raspberry Pi, so plug your USB cable into the Pi, turn it on, and since we're going to be entering some commands into the Pi, feel free to pull up our step-by-step -step guide so that you can copy and paste instructions instead of typing them in and worrying about typos, and you'll find the guide at gallagher.com slash pi dash cabinet, all lowercase, then scroll down until you find the section labeled Log into Raspberry Pi and install the Schedule Python library. So with my Pi powered on, remember it takes about 30 seconds for it to boot, I'm going to launch a terminal session and log into the Pi. Now on the Mac you can launch the terminal program from Spotlight by typing Command plus Spacebar, then Spotlight pops up, I'm going to type the word Terminal in here, press Return, the terminal program launches, then I'll press Shift Command plus sign a few times to increase the font size in Terminal, and I'll log into my Pi using the SSH command. Now you probably know this from setting up your Pi, what we need to do is type in SSH pi at your pi's host name, dot local, press return, enter your password, press return, and you can see by the command prompt that we're logged into our pi. 
Now, if your Pi already has the host name that you want for this project, you're fine. But you might notice that my host name is Pi-Backup. Now, I actually flashed a backup copy of a configured Raspberry Pi that I'd made earlier onto an SD card. I just followed the steps in the tutorial that I referred to at the start of this video. This is a real-time saver, but if I do this, I do need to change my host name so that I don't have a bunch of Raspberry Pis, all with the name Pi-Backup. So let me do this quickly to change the host name, launch raspy config with sudo raspy dash config, press return, press return to select system options, we get a new screen, use the arrow keys to highlight host name, press return again, select OK, enter a new host name, I'm going to rename my Pi to Pi Cabinet, press return, then right arrow key twice to select finish, press return again. Do I want to reboot? Select yes. And after about 30 seconds, I can log in again with SSH, but this time I've got to say SSH Pi at Pi Cabinet, my new host name, dot local, my password is the same, and we're ready to continue. I just need to remember that from now on, this Pi is known as Pi Cabinet. So let's head back to our web page of instructions and find the command pip3 install schedule. Highlight it, copy it, then return to the terminal, paste it in, and press return. Now your system might look like it's hanging. Sometimes it takes about 30 seconds to look like it's doing anything, but the software will eventually install in about a minute. Now, what did we just do? Well, the Python language doesn't come with commands to schedule tasks, but since we want our LED light to flash at a given time, we need these scheduling commands. So this pip3 command goes out to the internet, it finds the additional software library named schedule, and it installs it. So now we can write and run Python programs that use these scheduling features. Now, since we're gonna be scheduling events on the Raspberry Pi, we need to set our Pi to the current time zone. And to do this, we get back in raspy config. So let's launch that program with sudo raspy dash config, press return, and we set our time zone in localization settings. So use the down arrow to highlight that option. Notice that localization is spelled with British spelling, a reminder that the Raspberry Pi Foundation is a UK-based nonprofit. Thanks to our friends in Great Britain. Press return to select this. Then on this screen, use the arrow keys to select time zone, press return. The screen will flash for a second. It might look like raspy config has crashed. It hasn't, so just be patient. Then use the arrow keys to highlight your continent and press return. I'm in North America, so I'm gonna select America. Then press return and you'll get another one of those flashes that looks like a crash. And unfortunately, the city names aren't alphabetical. I'm not sure how they're organized because Anchorage is a city in the United States, but then we have a few locations in the Caribbean and some South American cities. Also, all major cities aren't listed. So my city is Boston, but it's not in the list. So I'm gonna keep scrolling until I find the largest city in my time zone, that's New York City. It's about a four hour drive south of Boston. I have to go through three sets of cities that sort of look like they're alphabetical until I can find New York. And then with New York highlighted, I'll press return. The screen flashes, I'll right arrow twice, I'll press finish and then I'm back at the prompt. And we can see that the local time is listed in 24 hour time, but it's the same as my Mac, one o'clock. Well, I'm a couple seconds off, but the Pi and the Mac both get their time over the internet. So you should assume that your Pi is gonna be pretty accurate. Now let's add the smart cabinet Python code to our Raspberry Pi and then modify the alarm times. And the first thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna create a blank file named smart underscore cabinet dot pi using the nano program. And then we can paste our code from the web into this file and then we can run it on our Pi. So first what we wanna do is we wanna copy this command, return to terminal, paste it in, press return, and we've begun to create a file named smart underscore cabinet dot pi. Now back in our tutorial document, there's a link to the GitHub stored project files. So click on this link and it will take you to what's called the GitHub repo for this project. That's just a collection of files for this project that are saved on the GitHub site. And down below, you'll see some readme information. But what I'd like you to do is to find this file named smart underscore cabinet dot pi, click on that, and that opens a web page that shows you the single Python program file that will run our Pi cabinet project. Now we only need to change a single line of our Python program to change the schedule time for lighting up our LED reminder light. And I'll show you that explicitly in just a bit, but I'll also give you an overview really quickly of what these statements are doing. Now these import statements that you see here refer to all of the libraries we use in our program that extend the basic Python programming language with extra commands that we use in this program. Now, most of these libraries refer to libraries that were installed as part of installing CircuitPython, but we see the schedule library is mentioned here. That's that library that we installed earlier in this tutorial. Now, this block of code here sets up what I call the door sensor, which is just the name for our magnetic switch. And what we're doing is we're reading data from GPIO pin 23. That's what the D23 means. Now, just below that, we set up our LED on pin 24. And by setting LED value to true, we turn it on when the program first starts. And I also set a value in the program named flash to true. I'll use this flash value to turn the LED on and off when the program first runs, and it'll continue flashing until the lid is lifted. 
Now, right here is the most important line in our code. Alarm times is a variable that holds a list that the Pi will use to turn on our LED light at all the times that are listed. Now, by default, I've put three alarm times in here, 5 a.m., and since we have to use 24-hour time, 1700 is 5 p.m. and 2200 is 10 p.m. Now, notice our entire list of times is inside of square brackets, and each time has two digits in the front, even 5 a.m. It needs to be 05 for 5 o'clock, Then the times are enclosed in single quotes and multiple times are separated by commas. Now getting the syntax right is really important because if we skip something, like forgetting a comma to separate times or forgetting a single quote at the end of a time, the program will crash. Now we'll eventually modify this line together inside of the terminal program, but let me continue to give you an overview of the rest of this code. This block of code just gets the current time and prints it out on screen. That's the first thing we'll see when we run our program. Now this chunk of code here loops through all of the alarm times, and for each alarm time, it schedules a job to do, which is up here, and that's simply turn on the LED light. Now this happens when the program first runs, and we'll print out each of the scheduled times after we've scheduled the job at that time. Now down here, everything after this while true is an infinite loop. This block of code will execute over and over, top to bottom, as long as we leave our program running. Now the first thing that we do is we check to see if our LED light should be flashing. Now this only happens when we first run our program. We flash the light just to show that our Pi is working. Now this line here will simply switch the light on if it's off and off if it's on. We'll do this every half second, but if the lid is opened, we check that in this line here, we'll print out the word stop flash, we turn off the LED light, and then we set flash to false so that we never run this block of code again. Now, if we're not flashing, then we're going to run this block of code. Now, we've scheduled our different times where we should be turning on our light. So we just check to see if we should run the turn on light job here. Then we check to see if the door is open. And if the door is open, we'll simply print out the word door open over and over again. We'll turn off the LED if it's on. Otherwise, we'll print out the words door closed. We'll wait half a second before repeating this, and we'll repeat this over and over again. That's it. Just 80 lines here. And remember, probably about 30 lines or so are comments or blank lines, so there's really not much to this at all. And if you don't know Python, but you'd like to learn, you can refer back to this code as another reference example. So now let's get this code into our Pi. We want to highlight all of the code from the very last character of the last line through the very first character of the first line, then copy this, head back to terminal, and paste it into nano. Now we just pasted in all of our code. It's more code that we can show on a single terminal screen. So the terminal program has paged through several screens. And so Nano is showing us the very last screen on a multi-screen program. Now let's head back to our browser. We'll press the back button a couple of times to return to our instructions. And we've already covered the points on how times are written in our alarm times list. So why don't we go ahead and edit these times in our code. And we'll set a time that will light up the light shortly after we run our program. So we'll head back to the terminal and let's find the line that lists our alarm times. And in order to do that, we'll press the up arrow over and over again until we reach the top of the screen. When you press it after reaching the top of the screen, we'll see the previous page of code. It looks Looks like we have to go back through four screens of code until we find the alarm times line that we want to modify, but here it is. Now let's set an alarm time that will go off in just a few minutes. Now my Mac time currently says it's 1.04 p.m. So I'm going to add an alarm time to go off at 1.08 p.m. So why don't you set an alarm, let's say five or six minutes in the future of your current alarm time. So I'm going to head back to my alarm times line down here. And just before the closing square bracket, I'm going to type in a comma so that I can add a new time. Now I need to put the time between single quotes, so I'll type two single quotes and then left arrow so I can type between those quotes. My new time in 24 hour time is going to be 13 colon 08, that's 108 p.m. We see the new time is between single quotes and Nano has quite nicely colored the text between the quotes in green. So you can do the same with a time that's just a few minutes in the future of whatever your time is now. And if you ever want to come back in here and modify times, you can do it right in this line. You can delete any of the times that you don't want. You can add any new times that you want to schedule. And so now I'm done with the modifications I want to make. So I'm going to quit out of Nano and save my changes. So we quit out of Nano with a control X. Then I'm going to type in Y. Then I'm going to press return to accept the file changes with this file name. I'm back at the prompt. And we've just added a file to the Pi that's named smart underscore cabinet dot pi and that contains a bunch of python code that our pi can execute so let's run our code so let's head back to our web instructions and we see in the section run the smart underscore cabinet dot pi program the command that we want to enter is just this word python 3 no space between the python and the 3 followed by the file name so let's highlight this line copy it head back to the terminal we'll paste it in but before you press return take a good look at your box 
Now press return, and we see the LED light starts to flash, we see the current time, and I see all four times scheduled that were listed in alarm times. The LED is flashing, open the door, door open prints to the terminal, the flashing stops, close the door, door closed prints to the terminal. Now the current time is 1.07 on my Apple Watch and my Mac, and the Pi gets its time from the internet, so that should be the time on the Pi too. I'm going to hold my watch up so that you can see the time switch over from 1.07 to 1.08. Now in the meantime, we see door closed prints every half second, and if you want to modify the code, you can go ahead and delete these print lines. We don't really need them, but it is a nice way to get a response to the terminal that says, yes, we are reading switch data every half second to see if the door's been open. And there we go. We see the alarm just went off. Time to take my meds. So nice work. The project works great. Put your meds back and the red light should go off again at the next time that's scheduled in your alarm times. Now, just in case things aren't working, if you scroll to the very end of our instructions page, you'll see my suggestions for troubleshooting. But hopefully all is well, and there are just a few more things I want to do to finish up this project. First, let's stop this program from executing, and you can stop any executing Python program by typing Control c And when you do that, you'll get a message stating the last line that was executed, and you'll be returned to the prompt. Now, why don't we go back into Nano, and you can enter your actual times so that the LED will light up according to your med schedule. Now, I could type the command nano smartcabinet.py here, but remember our shortcut? If you press the up arrow at the prompt, you see the previous command that you entered, and if you press the up arrow a second time, we see two commands back. We entered this very line that we want, the one to get us into nano, so I'm going to press return here. That saves me some typing. This time, Nano starts up at the first character of the first page, rather than the last character of the last page, which is where we ended up when we first pasted our code into Nano. And if we keep pressing the down arrow, you'll see that we page through screens of code. It looks like our alarm times line is about four screens into our code. Here it is. Now, I only want my alarm to go off each day in the morning at 5 a.m., so I'm going to delete all of these other times. I'm going to get rid of all of the commas, but I'm going to place my project right next to my coffee maker so that it reminds me to take my lutein Ivan vitamins right when I get my morning cup of joe. So now that I'm done editing things, I'm going to exit out of nano with control X. I'll save the file and I'm back at the prompt. Now there's one more thing that we want to do. We want our program to run automatically whenever we plug our Pi in and turn it on. We shouldn't have to open up the terminal program and SSH into our Pi whenever we want to run this program. And we also want to make sure that the program restarts automatically if we have a power outage. And the way that we'll get this code to execute automatically is by using the cron utility. So let's head back to our web page. We'll scroll down to the section that says scheduling the smartcabinet.py program to run automatically using the cron utility. And here's the command that we want to enter. It's simply cron tab dash E, highlight that, copy it, return to the terminal, paste it in and press return. And what this does is it will allow us to edit the cron tab file, which lets us set up commands to run at given times. Now, the first time that we try to edit cron tab, your Pi will ask you which editor you'd like to use. We've been using nano, so I'm going to select one. Nano launches. We see our cron tab file. Now, you can feel free to read the comments if you're interested, but for now, I'm just going to press my down arrow button repeatedly until I get to the very last line in this file. Then I'm going to return to my browser. And the command that we want to enter is this one that starts with at sign reboot. So I'm going to highlight this whole command and copy it. Now this line runs our smart cabinet Python program every time our Pi starts. So let's return to nano, paste it in, exit nano with a control X, save our file, and that's it. Now just to make sure this is working, I'm going to return to my browser. I'm going to copy this line here, sudo reboot, which will log me out and reboot the Pi. I'll paste that into the terminal and I'll press return. And I can see by the prompt that I'm no longer logged into Pi Cabinet. And if you wait 30 seconds, while we won't see anything happening on the terminal, you should be able to tell that your Pi has executed the commands in your cron tab properly and run your Python code because the LED will start flashing. You can open and close the lid and you've just armed your smart cabinet so it's ready to light up its LED any times that you've scheduled in your Python code. So feel free to do whatever you'd like to neaten up your project. I use clear packing tape to wrangle the wires on the back of the box, and I attach the Pi to the side of the box using double-sided foam tape. You also shouldn't need to use your Pi power supply with the switch if you plan to use that with new Pis that you're going to buy for other projects. So instead, what I've done is I just use a standard micro USB cable, and I plug that into a USB port that I've got that's attached to an outlet lying around the house. But if you've gotten to the end, congratulations, maker. You just built yourself a very useful, 
Evil Tech for Good project. And you've also got a great start if you'd like to one day expand on this project to do more things like maybe play sound as part of the alarms or even send text messages as alerts. All of those things are possible, but for now, feel good about your skills. And if you like this, there are lots more projects on all sorts of topics on my YouTube channel. If you're so inclined, kindly like, comment, and subscribe. That gooses the YouTube algorithm to make it easier for others to find that content. It really helps me out. And if you build a project, tweet a picture at me so I can celebrate your awesomeness. And if you're an educator who found this useful, let me know and please share with others. I love learning that others are using the content as well. Now go make something awesome.